This is Ambition Today. Today we are joined by Wes Schaefer. He is the, he is the CEO of the Sales Whisperer Incorporated, helping founders with professional sales training and inbound marketing. This is Ambition Today. These are the entrepreneurs, creators, investors, and builders who ambitiously change to the world. Explore the hardships and heroisms of everyday life while we reveal the key moments to leave behind a lasting legacy. This is Ambition Today with Kevin Siskar. What's up, world? I am Kevin Siskar, and you are listening to Ambition Today. Make sure you subscribe to our website, siskar.co, or in your favorite podcast app, anywhere podcasts are available, so you don't miss the latest episodes. You can now join the show's back channel, which we're formally calling the A-List, short for Ambition List, and hear the single greatest piece of advice our guests have ever received, such as last episode when we talked to Gabe Zickerman. He's the CEO and founder of Onward, which helps you achieve tech-life balance by reducing your excess screen time. But today I'm excited because we are joined by the sales whisperer himself, Wes Schaefer. He's been helping founders and business people all over the world with professional sales training and inbound marketing. Wes, welcome to our mission today. Where are you today? Hey, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I am at home, man. Sunny Southern California. Got the flip-flops on and uh, just ready to get this thing going. Nice, awesome. Uh, it, we hit eighty degrees in New York City today, so uh, you know we're catching up slowly. It's a long winter here. <laughs> Fifty nine degrees right now, so I tell people it's so cold we're wearing socks with our flip flops. Nice, awesome. Well, <laughs> I want to start the story where we start with everyone, right? Let's take it back to the childhood. Um, tell us one lesson from growing up that that really had an impact on you and, and stays with you even today. Oh wow! I, I have to say this for the bonus round. I thought, man, now you're now you're throwing me a curveball, huh? <laughs> a lesson from childhood. So what were some of your what were some of your early influences? Um, did you have entrepreneurial parents, uh, aunts, uncles? Like, what sort not, of put you in that mindset? Not really. Um, okay. You know, the, um, my dad he went out on his own for a short time. Um, we were living in Houston and when the whole savings and loan crisis hit and oil had collapsed and Houston was just a mess in um, early, early mid eighties. Uh, he tried to go it on his own in construction and just, um, you know, he, he didn't have the, the runway, you know, to yeah. make it. Uh, he was a foreman, you know, he was superintendent around the whole city of Houston for the, this construction division. And, that's different than running your own business. So that was really my only exposure to real uh, entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, I was seeing my dad struggle to launch his own thing. So I, um, I came from, you know, my background was my parents saying, hey, just get a good education, right? Neither of them graduated from college. And, you know, my dad said, go to good school, get a degree, and things will be okay. And uh, I remember my great grandfather. I was fortunate enough to know him. I, I was I was in my early twenties when he died, and so he was in his late nineties. I remember sitting on his front porch in um, in south southeast Texas, and um, he was sitting there chuckling. He says, "The secret is to get you a job with a good pension." You know, he says, "I've drawn a pension longer than I worked." He would just sit there and chuckle. Well, I mean, he was an anomaly, right? I mean, when Social Security was made and pensions, you know, set the age at 65, you were supposed to die at, at 64. Yeah. After he retired, I mean, they, you know, he was an outlier. So I, uh, so I got good grades. I got recruited to play football at the Air Force Academy. And, of course, if you get accepted to any of the academies, uh, the education is free. They actually pay you. They just take it out of your hide. Right for four years, and you owe them five years. So even that, you know, had nothing to do with sales and marketing. Yeah. But, so you joined. So you joined the Air Force after high school. Um, first of all, thank you for your service. No, um, you. Second of all, tell us about that experience, and uh, and you know, how long did you do it? What did you gain from from that? Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's four years just uh, just grueling work. It's um, you know, your first year, you're you're nobody. They call us smacks. At the Air Force Academy, it's a it's a soldier minus ability, coordination, and knowledge. So, <laughs> so that's your greeting, and um, you know they they greet you as soon as you pull up by yelling at you, tell you to get off the bus. Uh, you know they give you three duffel bags, put your name on it, give you a three ring binder, and say make the room look like this. 
And uh, of course you fail because it's hard and you're tired and you're in some new environment. And so, you know, they spend a, they spend a six weeks in basic training, breaking you down. They spend a, in the rest of the year building you back up and then three more years of learning leadership and whatnot. And, uh, you know, while taking, you know, a pretty heavy load, I mean, the minimum, I think is 15 hours. Usually we took 18 to 21 hours a semester and it's all engineering. And I mean, I was a geography major. I'm still taking physics and chemistry and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, civil engineering, aeronautical, astronautical, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy. And, um, but when you get done, you realize what you really can do, right? Which is, you can do a lot more than you think. Um, you're just never pushed. You know, most of us aren't pushed. So we get in a rut, but, uh, you're capable of a whole lot more. And that, um, and, you know, those four years there and five years in active duty, you know, reinstilled that. Yeah, we had um, we had Anthony Pompliano on the show, and he he also was a a, a young um, veteran, and you know similar similar story. And he's second as well as so you you get out and you realize things um, that you're capable of that that peer, other peers your age don't realize. Right? You've spent some time with older people. You know, everyone around you is talking about real life stuff, and your friends are maybe just still talking about the, the latest movie. Right? And so yeah, you have that sort of awareness advantage. Um, coming out of it. So that, that's great. And, and thank you again for, uh, for your service. Um, so then you went to Texas A&M, studied meteorology. Um, what, tell, like, what, tell us about that. Why, why meteorology? You know, I kind of fell into it. When I was graduating in 92, um, they started having drawdowns in pilot slots. And we were guaranteed a, a slot if you pass the physical. And, um, but you were looking at um, three years potentially to wait for your slot to open. And then one year pilot training, you owed eight. So you were signing up for 12 years. And I was like, you know, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do 12 years. And um, so I was like, what are my options? And they said, well, you know, you could, we'll send you to Texas A&M for uh, another degree. And, uh, you know, I'm from Houston. So I was like, well, I get to go home, right, for a year <laughs> with pay. You yeah. know, it's yeah. like, and I didn't incur any extra time. So it was still within the five years. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And um, so it was basically that simple. <laughs> nice. Well, um, so then you, I know you left the comfort of, of the Air Force and, and what you called a pension, a pension job before um, right. to enter the eat what you kill world of sales. Right. Tell us about that leap, that transition, and, and why you made it. Yeah, it was um, – it was a little crazy, but I mean, deep down, I, I always had this kind of rebellious spirit. I mean, I got into a good bit of trouble at the Air Force Academy. Uh, I'd get leadership roles. I'd get fired from leadership roles. I was always questioning authority, like, why does it have to be this way? And, you know, that uh, looking back, it's like, I don't know if I can make it through today. They, they're, they're a lot stricter. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I just had it in me. Um, and, you know, growing up where we had money and then we didn't have money, um, I realized I, I liked it better when we did have money and looking around, I knew that that sales was the, the fastest path, uh, to make more money and being able to set your own income, right? Not, not, not get a job and just hope for a three or 5% raise each year. You know, it was like, again, go eat what you kill. And I don't know. It was, I had it in me. So I took the risk. Where do you think? The, the innate instinct to question authority, um, have it in you. Where do you think that came from? You know, maybe going back to the childhood or growing up, we were like, what, what instilled that in you, do you think? Yeah, I've always had it. And, and it's not so much question authority. Uh, I just question like the rationale of things. If something just doesn't make sense, I don't want to do it. Right. Uh, and that's where you have to have a good leader that basically says, Trust me, kind of like, you know, Mr. Miyagi in The Karate Kid, right? Wax on, wax off. He's like, why am I doing this? You know, and he's like, trust me. And, and he did trust him, but eventually he even got tired of it. And then, of course, he starts throwing strikes at him, and, and it all made sense, right? He was preparing him for something bigger. But good leaders are hard to find. Uh, and, you, and you get a, a strong-willed individual, you know, if you can't connect with them, then you just have to beat them into submission, right? And I'm just not one to go down without, without a fight. And um, so in ninth grade, you know, I, 
I challenged my my ancient world uh, history teacher because uh, he would give a, a review. You know, I told the story to him on Facebook. You know, we're connected. He would do a review before each test. And I was playing sports. I was in student council. I had a long commute, you know, but he'd get off on these tangents. And and one day before a test, you know, I raised my hand and said, Mr. Mabry, I'm like, is this on the test tomorrow? He said, no, it's not. I said, can we please stick to the test review? And he was like, yes. And so for the rest of the year, we had the, the Schaefer theory of relevancy. And he would actually stop and look at me and say, Mr. Schaefer, may we proceed down this thread, right, down this path? And so I had, I had veto power on uh, test review topics. And so, I mean, even so 14 years old, right, I'm like, this is not practical. This does not, does not compute, right? It is not efficient. I need to be efficient. And so that's, I don't know, just in me. Yeah, yeah. So, so when did you become the sales whisperer? Tell us the evolution of, of how that happened. I was born that way, man. <laughs> uh, but actually, I bought the URL September 1st, 2006. Um, I was still in corporate America. I was with a startup, and I'd been in and out of multiple startups from uh, 2000 until 2006, 2007. And um, we, um, but I wasn't satisfied. Training was usually pretty bad. Um, we usually we didn't have sales training. We had product training, right? And the operations department or the marketing department would run it. They had nothing, no real knowledge of sales. They gave us the wrong tools, wrong leads. So I was always trying to get better, buying books, going to conferences, you know, trying to get my company to pay for whatever I could, you know, to save money. But um, if they wouldn't pay for it, I'd pay for it. You know, I invested in myself. And as I got better, you know, I actually found a sales coach. And, and I liked him. I went through his 12 week program. Uh, you know, back in 2006, I mean, there was no Facebook, there was, there was no membership sites. There wasn't all the video. I mean, it was a, it was a 12 week call, a group recorded call and a PDF but it changed my life, you know? And I began working with him one-on-one, -on -one, hired him. I became a licensee of his content. Um, but I just, the name just hit me, you know, the sales whisperer, watch the dog whisperer. It's like, yeah, I, I rehabilitate salespeople and I train their managers, you know, cause Caesar Milan would say that he rehabilitates the dogs. You know, the dogs act up because they don't have strong leadership. They're afraid, they're anxious, they don't know what to do. And so that's why I say I rehabilitate the salespeople who've been misled. And most sales managers haven't had good sales management training sales leadership training, right? They were just hired from within. And, uh, and the attributes of a good sales person usually aren't great for sales management, right? They're, they're solopreneurs, lone wolves, aggressive, competitive, impatient, you know, and now you've got to grow a team and lead a team and you need different skill sets. And so, you know, September 1st, I bought that name, uh, 2006, uh, and then I trademarked it. So you've got this domain, the sales whisperer, uh, and I love the name because, I, and I like the analogy to dogs. It's amazing, you know. You meet you meet dog owners, and um, and they're like, "Oh, I don't understand how your dog's so good and my dog isn't." And you're like, "Well, I do." <laughs> <laughs> what kind of example are you giving them? Yeah, exactly. yeah, they're just following your lead. So no, it's it's a great analogy, and and it's it's interesting about how aggressive you need to be in sales, and then how that doesn't really lead to the nurturing mentality of of managers, and that's great. So. So how has the business evolved, right? Like bringing us up from, you know, September 1st, 2006 to 2018. Where where are you today? Um, and, and how is it how has it changed and grown? Yeah, it has changed a lot. And and that's one thing uh, you know, I hope to instill in your listeners is you know, to be open to change. And it, it's everything's a dichotomy. Everything has has a flip side. And you need to, to you need to do what you're great at, okay, for as long as possible. But you have to also know when it's time to shift gears a little bit, or shift directions, or add another uh, leg to the table of your offering. You know, so I started out sales training uh, late '06, early '07. Did not have a website. Did not have a merchant account. Did not have an office. Uh, and I was I was selling what I knew, which was 
sales training program from my coach. And so I'm doing that, making cold calls, driving people, inviting them to an event. I do a live workshop every three weeks. Um, and so I needed to grow. I needed to scale, right? So I was looking at software. I was looking at tools. Uh, I was studying marketing. I was learning from Dan Kennedy on direct response marketing, magnetic marketing. Um, and I ran across a company he was um, an early investor in. It was Infusionsoft. So I went to a workshop, actually just to meet Dan Kennedy. And then I learned about Infusionsoft, saw the power of it. They were really early in the game. Uh, this was 10 years ago, 2008. And um, I bought the software for myself, but then I saw the opportunity of affiliate marketing and residual income that they offered uh, of being a certified partner. So because I was in sales, but I was good at marketing and I realized Infusionsoft would help me market and others needed help with their marketing and their automation, I became a certified partner and just became a product of the product. I used it and talked about it, followed marketing 101, right? I was a product of the product. And before long, I was one of their top resellers in the world. And the residual income it created gave me a lot of freedom and flexibility. I grew my team, expanded my offerings. Um, now we work with multiple platforms, um, you know, in the same line. And our, I've got my own coaching programs. And so it's, you know, it's evolved. And, you know, I've made a lot of money selling other people's stuff, you know, so... So be open to possibilities. I think people get into trouble. A guy was commenting just today in one of my private groups that he started, he had an idea, launched it. It wasn't very successful, uh, you know, and, and I'm like, pre-sell your idea. You know, everybody, they go all in on one idea and, and you just, it, it puts you at too much risk. That's why so many businesses fail, you know, uh, um, and not everybody's going to be Steve Jobs, right? He or Henry Ford, you know, if you ask people what they want, they'd say they wanted a faster horse. Okay, so Henry Ford and Steve Jobs were really good. Maybe they were lucky. Maybe they were super insightful. Maybe they were gifted. Okay, fine. Everybody else, you know, we need to look around and see what the market needs and test it, validate it, you know, before we go all in. Um, and you know, a good way to do that, I think is through affiliate marketing, find something that already has some traction, offer it, clean it up, uh, put your own spin on it, attach your own bonuses on top of that to make it a differentiator and then iterate from there. Uh, I think it's, it's a safer way to try to grow. Yeah. I love the scrappy nature of it. You don't always need to, you know, spend $50,000 building a piece of software at first. You can, you can be scrappy and, you know, put the puzzle pieces together and just tie them and package them. And yeah, I love, I love that. It's a great point for, for founders. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We are here with Wes Schaefer, uh, talking about sales whispering and his company. Uh, we'll be right back with more. This is ambition today. Ambition today is happy to partner with WeWork, a co-working space that lets you do what you love. With offices in over 140 locations worldwide, many of our portfolio founders use WeWork for the office, for their company, um, and they work with everyone from one-person spaces to, to full-team offices. So check out uh, siskar.co slash WeWork to get your discount today. And Ambition Today is happy to partner with Top Tall. If you're looking for software developers to help build your next product, then visit toptall.com slash ambition today for a free two-week trial with the top 3% of software developers and designers. You will own all the work, all the code from anything built during your trial. That's T-O-P-T-A-L dot com slash ambition today to get started now. And now back to this episode. Visit Ambition Today online at Siskard.co and follow the show on social media at Ambition Today. Welcome back. We are here with Wes Schaefer talking about the sales whisperer. Um, Wes, we're going to jump back into it. I want to play a quick YouTube clip before uh, before we go back. You ready? Right. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. 
always be closing. A-I-D-A, attention, interest, decision, action. Attention, do I have your attention? Interest, are you interested? I know you are, because it's fuck or walk. You close or you hit the bricks. Decision, have you made your decision for Christ? An action. A-I-D-A, get out there. You got the prospects coming in. You think they came in to get out of the rain? A guy don't walk on the lot lest he wants to buy. They're sitting out there waiting to give you their money. Are you gonna take it? Are you man enough to take it? <clears throat> so Wes, we have this sort of, you know, era of, you know, masculinity and, and selling and, you know, always be closing the famous uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross clip. Um, you know, what advice do you, do you really think it's that intense? Like what advice do you have for startup founders um, who are maybe just starting out, they need to make sure, do they always need to be selling? What sort of mentality and approach do you like to tell people starting out with their own company um, to be in? What, what mindset? Yeah, that's um, that's an unfortunate carryover of a bygone era. Right? I love the movie, uh, and uh, for the most part, I like Alec Baldwin as an actor. <laughs> His personal side, maybe not so much, but hey, the guy's funny. He, he's got some powerful roles, and that's a um, that's a top top movie in general. But the message, you know, you think about it, that movie came out in like 1992, I think 93, somewhere in there. But it was written on based on a play from like, I don't know, the 80, early 80s, written in the 70s by a guy who modeled it after what he saw from his father, right? Literally in the 50s or 60s. So this thing, that, that methodology, that mindset is going back 60 plus years, okay? And so 60 plus years ago, yeah, you could close really hard. You could go door to door. You could, and they literally would cold call. They'd just cold call the white pages. Hey, you want to buy some insurance? Um, you know, go by the fuller brush salesman and, and that, that worked, but now we have, I, mean, I don't know, the Google, right? We have social media, we have Twitter, we have Yelp. And, and if you're a jerk like that, you're going to get so, um, burned. Uh, it's not good. And, you know, when you think about it, all these people that act real tough on that, always be closing, you know, I say, let me ask you something. Are you married? Do you have a mother? Do you have a sister? Do you have a favorite niece, a favorite aunt? Would you like me to treat them like that? Right? Hey, sweetheart, come here. You buy this thing right now. What's it going to take to get the money right now? Come on. We're going we're gonna to offer gift wrapping. What? We'll give you an extra warranty. You know you need this. You know, any fool would could see this is the best deal ever. You're an idiot if you don't take this deal right now. You want your mom talk to you like that? You know, yeah. and then it kind of hits home. They're like, yeah, probably not. Yeah. You know, and like, does that scale? Well, are you, are you endearing yourself to them? Right. So I took that ABC and I made it, I added two more, a D and an E. And I made it circular. It's a reference. Instead of a pipeline or a funnel, right? We have the image of just cram enough things in the top, throw enough stuff in the opening, throw enough crap against the wall. Something's bound to stick. Okay, and so it's one way. Put stuff in, comes out the other end, and and some leaks out, and that's it. But it's but it's not it, right? So it's a trap. You're always attracting people to your place of business, your website. You're attracting them to give their information with a lead magnet, a free report, something. Hey, birthday, you know, free burrito on your birthday. I had a fast food Mexican restaurant here in four four locations. We just did a, a birthday burrito. Bam! People are now opting in. Okay. Now they can market to them for birthdays, for quinceañeras, for for graduations, for Cinco de Mayo, you know, for March Madness. I mean, on and on and on, right? So now they can cater. They can do all these different things. So they've attracted. Now you bond, right? Multimedia, multi-step. Stay in touch. Get their phone number. Get their address. Get their social media. Get their email. You know, multiple touches, multimedia. Then you convert that to the sale. You close it. Get the cash. But you're only – it's the halfway point, Now you have to delight. You have to deliver a wow experience. Now you've endeared yourself to them. They're bragging about you. They're taking pictures. They're sharing it on social media, which brings us back full circle, right? Now you're at the attract phase again, except I've endeared myself to you. You've shared the story. Now your friends and family are are clicking the link and saying, who is this guy? 
Now they opt in and it, and it goes faster and faster and faster. So, yeah, you know, I think the new ABCs are like, always be courteous, always be curious, uh, always be concise. Too many salespeople talk too much. Our job is to ask questions, not to flap our gums. Yeah, to listen. So, yeah, right. We should be you know, two ears, one mouth, right? Use them proportionately. That means you have to add, ask more questions and then shut up and listen to the answers. And your prospects will tell you what they want and how to sell to them. I, I love that. Um, and, and I want to stick with the, the changing landscape of, of sales over the years. So uh, you have a TED Talk. Everyone could go check it out on YouTube if they want to see it. Um, but in your TED Talk, you said it, it's 1926 all over again, right? And I want to touch on this because um, – there's, there's an essay by Paul Graham, um, who's a famous guy in Silicon Valley, um, and it's called The Refragmentation. And in this essay, uh, Paul basically lays forth the, the hypothesis that all the recent trends we're seeing, uh, populism, you know, for the problems with fake news, are, are actually instances of the same phenomenon. And, and it, moreover, that the cause of this phenomenon is not some force that's pulling us apart, but rather the erosion of forces that had been pushing us together over the 20th century. And those two forces were World War II and the rise of large corporations like NBC, marketing media giants, etc. So um, I, I just I wanted to get your opinion. You know, is that is that what you think is happening? Um, it, it feels like the, the world is going back to the days where everyone has to be an entrepreneur to whether you're running a bakery or your own personal brand to get the next job. But you, the days of pensions are over and you really, everything's becoming individualized again. Um, what, do, what do you think? Refragmenting. Yeah, it does kind of feel that way. But I think as humans, we always take a good thing too far, right? So we're going to go to one extreme that'll, that'll fragment and implode and we'll go back the other way. Uh, kind of go back and forth. Uh, I think the internet uh, is a great equalizer. It really is making the world flat. Um, you're going to see, and also in society, society goes through uh, big swings. You mentioned, you know, World War II and, you know, the, the peak of that, you know, they call it the, the we generation was, was 1943. Well, we're coming up to another peak 80 years later. And in 2023, we're going to have the same peak. And, and Michael Drew and Roy Williams wrote about that in their book called Pendulum. And when you look at it, it's like really you really do see that. You see society making very predictable swings. Um, and But the Internet is certainly changing things. Um, it, it, lets, it lets a guy in Southern California hanging out in flip-flops sell to, to 2,300 people in 28 different countries and never – leave the house. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but human nature has never changed and never will change. We're, we're still, um, we, we like community. We, we thrive on that. We're not meant to be alone. Uh, and so you're going to see that's why you see companies like Google or whatever that, you know, they're creating this cool vibe. Um, I think, Maybe those the super big companies may not be as popular, but it's, 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 it is that fragmentation. Maybe we're going to like the super big companies and then like the super small and, and nothing in between. You see a lot of thriving, you know, 10, 20, 30 person companies. They've got a good vibe. Uh, everybody knows each other. Some are, are remote, but, you know, they're coming in, they're, they're doing fun things that, you know, casual Fridays, they're, they're going to baseball games together and things. So, People will always want to be with other human beings. Um, so just always remember that uh, and keep that in mind as you try to grow your business. You know, how can you improve and enhance that human touch? You know, I tell people all the time, write a letter, you know, write a book, write something, make something physical, tangible, and send it to them. Uh, you'll cut through the clutter. Because everybody's trying to get emails and LinkedIn messages, and and that gets old. Uh, so just remember that human touch. Yeah, being tangible, being real, which is actually a perfect segue to to my next question. Right? It seems like it seems like transparency, honesty uh, have become really important in in marketing 
in 2018. Where do you think the puck is going with regard to selling in an internet world, right? Are the, are the soft old schools still relevant? Uh, are they still important? Uh, you know, for, should CEOs, founders be practicing those? I mean, obviously they're talking to investors, so they need them for an extent. But or is the future all just digital growth hacking? You know, which is more important? How do you balance those two, soft skills and, and the internet growth hacking? Yeah, the it's still it's human nature. Um, how we reach people now uh, is more digital, right? We're, we're not reading newspapers. You know, fewer people are reading print magazines, uh, but still there's a human being at the other end of the screen. Okay. How you connect with them on their iPhone? Is it a pop-up? Is they get an opt-in on the text message? Do you call them? Do you bring them to a meetup and meet in person? You know, look at some of these celebrities like, Hey, I'm going to be at the mall, you know, and, and 20,000 kids show up to meet some YouTube, you know, celebrities. So they still want to have that tangible human touch. Uh, so the 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 medium is not the message okay you still have to have a powerful message why should i open your tweet why should i reply to your text why should i open your email that still matters uh and so that's still sales that's still communication that's still persuasion you know you've got to get those things right uh, and, and you're seeing like Facebook, they just had their first uh, downtick in subscribers ever. You know, there will be a competitor to Facebook at some point. You know, <laughs> people are already tired of it. They're, they're, uh, we're, we're segmenting ourselves into tighter and tighter silos. Uh, so keep your eye on the ball, you know, for what new thread might come out. But still, it's still sales. Uh, and you still have to give me a reason to pay attention to you, regardless of the medium. And I think that's where most people get it wrong. That's why everybody's exhausted. Uh, they're they're firing things off and all these. I need to be on Snapchat. I need to be on Pinterest. I need to be on Periscope. You know, I, and it's like, why? Yeah, you really need to just go deep on 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 these things. You can't spread yourself thin across all of them because you'll never succeed. You need to own every, yeah. really embed yourself in the culture. Well, yeah, go where your clients are, right? I'm helping a friend of my son's. He's 20 years old. Um, he realized college is not for him. He's, he got in, he's a great athlete, got into CrossFit. He's just ripped to shreds. He's got a very good fitness training program that he's created. Right now it's a 42-page PDF. I mean, this kid, he's left no stone unturned, uh, but he's 20 years old and everybody his age is on Instagram. And I'm like, and everybody's calling him, wanting his, his program, they don't have any money because they're a bunch of 20 something year olds that want to look like him, but they don't have any money. And, I, and I'm like, who's your ideal customer? And we start talking about it and it's like, your ideal customer is my wife, right? 35 to 55 years old. Maybe, you know, maybe 35 to 50, 30 to 45, somewhere in there. Mother, uh, married, uh, with money, maybe even single, right? Getting back newly divorced, getting back on the scene, willing to invest. You know, I'm like, so, so I'm like, picture my wife. Where does she hang out? Facebook, right? So you need to go where the market is. So, yeah. So, you know, so learn Facebook advertising, right? Go where your customers are. Don't just go where you're comfortable. Um, you know, it sounds like common sense, sounds like a no doubt statement, but Hey, if common sense was so common, um, it wouldn't be so rare. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Do you want to plug, do you want to plug it or is it not up yet? Uh, he doesn't even have a, well, he has a URL. So give me, ask me another question and I'll, I'll pull it up and see if he's got it redirected. Cause I, I've been showing him everything, you know, redirection, uh, landing pages, uh, yeah. autoresponders and email sequences. So, uh, but his name's Tanner Williams. You can, you can find him, uh, Tanner D Williams. Nice. Uh, um, look him up on Facebook. Uh, we'll get his website redirected. Um, I don't know why it's not working right now, but it, well, uh, well, if you want, if he's looking, if he wants to join the Founder Institute, I'll, I'll make sure, I'll make sure to get him in, get okay, him back cool. submissions. Um, so let's let's jump to the ambition today question of the day. Um, 
If you want to submit your question for the show, feel free to tweet at us or put it up on the, on the website for future episodes. Um, Wes, I know you have seven children. The ambition day question of the day is how do you maintain work-life balance to ensure you still prioritize and get time with your family with all you do? Uh, it can be tough and it has been tough and I've lived out of balance, um, more times than I should have. So, uh, so marry well, <laughs> uh, my wife has stayed home for 23 years. So that's been a, a big help. Um, but you know, we moved here to California 13 years ago, uh, right when we had our fifth child, cause we wanted to get closer to family, uh, because they help so much, you know, so her parents are close, aunts and uncles and cousins are close. So we're pitching in. It does take a village, you know, so be willing to accept help. Uh, that, that can be a good thing. Um, but uh, being able to work from home, that has helped. And, you know, I've turned some things down and, and have grown my business in different ways. Then it might have hurt me a little bit. I, I haven't been willing to travel very much. Uh, I haven't gone after the Road Warrior keynote speaker path. Uh, I don't want to live out of a suitcase. I don't want to be, you know, I, I was platinum on Marriott years ago and I don't want to be platinum again. <laughs> uh, so I, I've made some conscious decisions in that regard uh, on how to grow or, or not grow. Uh, so, you know, you just got to be aware of that. Realize too, most of what you see online is not true. Uh, I've, I've looked under the hood of, of thousands of businesses and entrepreneurs uh, and it's rare. I mean, single digit percentage rare that somebody's got it as squared away in real life as they appear to be. How do you, you know? how do you keep that awareness? Right. So like, you know, you said you've gone off tilt before, right? Maybe we've been working too hard, heads down, right? Like how do you, how can people keep that awareness so they know when they need to like get some help or, or, you know, um, you know, take a step back, you know, how do, how do you know? Um, I think your body tells you, right? If you, uh, we all carry stress in a different way. Uh, maybe you're grinding your teeth. Maybe you're getting these, getting these tension headaches. You've got, you know, knots in your shoulders. You're not sleeping. Um, so listen to your body. Uh, when I was learning how to golf years ago, I had an instructor, you know, he said form follows function. So basically after you make the swing, so you see the function, what's the ball doing? Did you slice it? Did you hook it? You know, did you chili dip it? You know, <laughs> Okay. There's the fun. Well, what, what's your form? How did you finish? So it's tough, right? You have to detach and look at yourself like you're an angel, you know, hovering over you in, in the, from the ceiling. Say, is my grip too tight? Am I, am I falling backwards? Am I falling forwards? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Let's change that. So your body's telling you what's going on. And so you got to listen. And, but that's where, um, you know, you need to learn to automate. You need to learn to delegate. Uh, you need to learn to delete. <laughs> you know, uh, I think we try to do too much. Uh, as entrepreneurs, we chase too many shiny objects. Um, you got to get very clear. I, I hear people talk about priorities. And that's really not a word. You know, uh, you have a priority. That's it. You know, it's, it, what is the first thing? What is number one? You know, because it comes before it's prior to everything else. If you have seven priorities, you have none. Uh, and so I love, you I love get, that, you know, you got to get clear on what you're doing because that's why we're tired. We're, you know, people that they, they want to launch 10 different things. And so they, they do one 10%, move the next 10%, and the next 10%, and the next 10%, they come back and do the next one to 20%. And launch one, get one to 100%, and then do the second. You know, and you may find that just doing the one is enough. You know, people are, people are, are, are cool being a fanatic for their sports team, right? They'll paint their body. They'll put stickers all over their cars. They'll buy coffee mugs. They'll buy chairs. They'll buy the little flags that go on there. It means fanatic. I am fanatical for my team. Why don't you get fanatical about your business? Dabbling doesn't do anything. You know, Steve Jobs was, was didn't dabble at Apple. Ford didn't dabble. Mark Cuban didn't dabble. Warren Buffett doesn't dabble in investing. 
right? He doesn't invest a little bit here and there and also crochet and try to grow a crochet business on Etsy. Right. Right? He invests in companies. That is it. So, but again, become a product of your product. Are you sold on yourself? Because if you're not sold on yourself, you ain't selling anybody else. Yeah. You know, become your own biggest fan. Yeah. Well, that's great advice. Um, thank you, Wes. This has been a great episode. Um, for those of you still listening, make sure you join us over on the back channel to hear the greatest piece of advice Wes has ever received. Siskar.co slash A-list to sign up today. The show notes, which include everything we talked about, links to everything we talked about, will be up on the website. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Share this episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Wes, thank you for being here. Where can people go to find out more about you, and is there anything they should be checking out? Um, so well, you mentioned the sales whisper, so I appreciate that. Um, but if you want to take control of your sales, I've got a free PDF and, and short video at thesalesagenda.com. Uh, and it's the exact agenda I learned in 06, how to take control of sales. Um, I use it to close seven-figure deals at Google, six-figure consulting contract with Dell. I mean, follow. It's a one-pager. You can use it, put your own logo on it, but it's the exact process I have followed uh, to take control of a sales meeting. And uh, so get that, apply it, uh, and I guarantee you're going to have better results uh, in your negotiations and in your, in your setups. Awesome, Wes. Well, thank you. We'll see you on the back channel in a second. For everyone else, stay curious, and we will see you on the next episode of Ambition Today. Thanks for listening to Ambition Today. Be sure to visit siskar.co to get all the information from this episode and more great content. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. <laughs>